Well, I think it takes a certain amount of courage to speak to an audience that has just eaten so well. <laughs> this morning while I was speaking, I was admiring the guide dog who was having a good nap during my <laughs> presentation. So, but anyway, I hope I won't put you to sleep. Uh, the gospel of life, which we are all called to proclaim uh, by our daily living, is first taught to us at home. It is in our home that we first come to understand the incomparable gift of human life and its cradle, which is the family constituted by the marriage of our parents. To honor all of you who have prepared the Living the Splendor of Truth Conference of Family Life International New Zealand, and of all of you who are participants in the conference, I offer a brief reflection upon the gospel of life as I first learned it and lived it at home. My father's mother emigrated to the United States of America from Cullen in County Cork, Ireland in the late 1800s. His grandfather, my great-grandfather, had emigrated to America in the first part of the 19th century from Ballygriffin in County Tipperary, also in Ireland. They brought with them a strong Catholic faith which inspired a true spirituality in the home. The home, in fact, was seen as a little church, an extension of the parish church in which Christ, who alone is our salvation, is encountered through the mystery of the sacraments, above all, the sacraments of penance and the Holy Eucharist. It was a spirituality of the Sacred Heart of Jesus whose image was enthroned in our home. The family lived with a profound sense of the presence of Christ in our home, for each of us had received the sevenfold gift of the Holy Spirit into our hearts from his glorious pierced heart. The Sacred Heart was the stable guest in our home, as he was also the stable guest of our hearts through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. My father's parents had married later in life, as was not unusual for the Irish in those times. As a result, they were only able to have two children, my father, Thomas, and my aunt, Agnes, who suffered from Down syndrome. My aunt's special needs instilled in all of the family a deep sense of the inviolable dignity of every human life, and in a particular way, of every human life which is in some way burdened by special needs, serious illness, or advanced years. I grew up with a consciousness which always included attention to those least brethren in the eyes of the world with whom our Lord identified himself in the parable of the Last Judgment. My mother's family had emigrated much earlier from England and were Protestant. My mother was raised in the American Baptist Church. Her mother, the only one of my grandparents that I was privileged to get to know a bit, even though she died when I was seven years old, was a devout Christian woman to whom my mother was very close. When my mother married my father, she was attracted to the Catholic faith and took instruction from an outstanding Irish priest, Father Bernard McKevitt, who was the parish priest of my father's home parish, Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary Parish in Richland Center, Wisconsin. My mother knew the Catholic faith thoroughly and was a strong part in the Catholic upbringing of my brothers and sisters and me. I'm the youngest of six children. Having witnessed the strength of her knowledge and practice of the Catholic faith during my childhood, I was surprised to learn that she had not always been Catholic. For her part, she always to her last days praised Father McKevitt for the manner in which he prepared her to enter into the full communion of the Catholic faith. She also expressed deep gratitude for the Christian faith of her parents, which prepared her to find the fullness of that faith in the Catholic Church. As I mentioned, a sound Irish spirituality permeated our home through my father. 
Predominant in our home was the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, strongly linked to Eucharistic devotion and devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, especially under her title of Our Lady of Lourdes. My parents loved the church and expressed that love in a particular way by their respect for the parish priest and the parochial vicars. Through my parents, I had a first understanding of the mystery of the priesthood. I came to have a special affection for our parish priest, Father Owen Mitchell, the successor of Father McKevitt, and also a native of Ireland. He was the first priest who strongly influenced my vocation. I will always be deeply indebted to him. Our parish was also served by a good number of religious sisters who taught in the parish school, for whom my parents also had the highest respect. I can say that from my first contact with the sisters, I found in them an extension of the love of my parents. They were spiritual mothers to us children. My parents were dairy farmers, which, which was at that time very typical of the families living in Wisconsin, my home state in the United States of America. In fact, the countryside of Wisconsin was dotted with small dairy farms on which 25 or perhaps as many as 50 cows were being milked twice a day to produce milk, butter, and cheese for others. There were numerous creameries and cheese factories throughout the countryside to which the small dairy farms would send each day the milk produced by the cows. I remember as a small child being imbued with a sense of responsibility toward those who would be eating dairy products produced from the milk of our farm. Truly I was taught to take a certain just pride in cooperating with nature and therefore with God to provide an important source of food for others. Farm work, while highly satisfying, was also hard and sometimes very challenging, especially when either bad weather or disease threatened the animals and therefore compromised the farmer's work. Those very difficulties taught me the need to work hard in order to accomplish what is good and to be resilient in the face of adversity. My parents taught us children always to remember that we as farmers were working with God in a direct way and therefore to count upon his providence in all things. In that sense, the importance of the Catholic faith was evident to us all. There was the sense of needing to be close to God if we were to work effectively with him and truly serve others. There was never any question about being stingy with God in the practice of the faith in order to gain more profit from the farm. There was never any question about the centrality of Holy Mass on Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation as the highest and most perfect expression of our Catholic life and as the principal font of blessing for us as individuals and for our work. Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation were also observed as days of rest. Saturday always included preparation for Sunday Mass. We had special clothes and shoes for Sunday Mass, which we had to make sure were ready, as well as making sure that we ourselves were prepared. I remember the importance attributed to the Rogation Days in the spring, during which special prayers were addressed to God to bless the fields and farm animals and all of the instruments of the farmer's work. In the same way, the ember days in the fall were important to seek God's blessing upon the harvest in order that it be bountiful and that we could gather it in effectively for our good and the good of our neighbors. These days were filled with a deep thanksgiving to God even as we were filled with wonder at the goodness of the harvest. 
Regular confession was part of family life. The whole family would go to the parish church on Saturday afternoon for confession. The family rosary was also a strong part of daily life. It was the way in which we nurtured a, a strong sense of the presence of our Lord in our lives, also through the mediation and intercession of Our Lady and of all the saints. The various mysteries of the rosary helped us to understand more fully what it means to live in Christ, to have the gift of Christ's life within us individually and within the whole church. Special times of the year were marked with special devotions. During Advent, there was the practice of the Advent wreath. During May, a special altar devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary was placed in the living room. I recall how delighted we children were to pick beautiful wild flowers which were abundant in the springtime of the year in Wisconsin and to bring them to adorn the May altar of our Blessed Mother and so to honor our Blessed Mother. Lent was marked by a more penitential meal on the Fridays, especially Good Friday. Good Friday and Holy Saturday were especially quiet and involved making preparations for the celebration of Easter Sunday. The reception of sacraments was seen as a major event in our lives. I remember well my own preparation for First Communion, First Confession, and First Holy Communion. I received my First Holy Communion in the month of May of 1956, two months before my father's death in July. He had been ill for over a year with a brain tumor, which the doctors in that time were slow to diagnose. He was dying at home and was unable to go to church for the First Holy Communion. When we returned home, my mother took me to his room. He had not been able to speak very much at all for some time. When he saw me, he smiled and said clearly, I am very proud of you today. It was so clear to me how important it was for him that I had received our Lord in Holy Communion. Another important lesson which my parents taught us was stewardship. First of all, our work was seen as stewardship, as cooperating with God in his care of our neighbor and of the world. Secondly, we were taught to sacrifice of ourselves for the good of the church and of others in need. I recall in particular how our father gave us something to put in the collection at the church during Sunday Mass. He wanted us to be formed in the habit of always contributing to the collection. Living on the farm, we as children had no need of money, but he would give us some money each week, all of which was to be given to the church. We might have had an idea of putting something apart for ourselves, but that was quickly corrected. The lesson learned was that all of the gifts which God gives to us are for his glory and for the service of our neighbor. It was an important lesson to learn. My father, in particular, used the dinner table to give us important lessons in good manners and in the human virtues in general. There was also a strong emphasis on how to act when visiting others. <laughs> All being told children are to be seen and not to be heard. <laughs> In other words, when we visited, we were quiet and we, you spoke when you were spoken to. I recall going with my parents to visit the homes of friends and neighbors and knowing to be quiet and respectful. I also learned from my parents the importance of showing hospitality to others who visited us. It always impressed me so much to see how immediately my, father, my parents would organize hospitality for unexpected visitors. As I mentioned before, my father became gravely ill in 1955. He was eventually diagnosed with a brain tumor. An operation was performed to remove part of the tumor, 
but it was located in a place in which the tumor could not be completely removed. Although he was hospitalized from time to time, he eventually came home to die. Although it was a very sad time, our Lord used, us, used it to teach the whole family more fully the sacredness of human life and its ultimate destiny with him in heaven. One particularly moving experience was when our parish priest, Father Mitchell, would bring my father Holy Communion. In those days, when the priest arrived at the door, and the priest always arrived in his cassock with the surplice uh, over the cassock, the whole family met him with a lighted candle and led him to my father's room. We would then all leave the room so that the priest could hear my father's confession. After his confession, we would enter the room again to be present for his reception of Holy Communion, which we all were kneeling. Somehow it was clear to me, even as a child, that it was our Lord who was sustaining my father, and that my father in dying was preparing to meet our Lord and to be with him. In the midst of our sorrow as a family, these moments of strong grace brought us peace and joy. All of what I have been describing was of incalculable, incalculable help to me in knowing and embracing my vocation in life. In a real sense, from the moment of our baptism, God is showing us how he wants each of us to give ourselves completely to him and to our neighbor in our vocation. It is also true that we can find true happiness in life only by knowing and embracing our vocation. I thank God that my parents understood their irreplaceable role in my vocation. I thank God, too, for parish priests who understood their irreplaceable role in fostering vocations, especially vocations to the priesthood and the consecrated life. With the advance of the years, and this year I had the milestone of my 70th birthday, I think of my childhood of my parents and family, and of my growing up on the farm with ever greater gratitude. My family and home parish and school and the work of the family farm truly provided for me an education in the gospel of life and divine love. Although there were moments of great challenge, trial and suffering, God provided for my family and me deep joy and peace in our knowledge, love, and service of him. In my vocation and mission as a priest and bishop, I've tried in a particular way to encourage strong family life for the good of individuals and of our society. As Pope John Paul II frequently indicated, the family is first and foremost in critical need of a new evangelization. In our Christian witness and apostolate, we must give special attention to the sanctity of marriage, to the fidelity, indissolubility, and procreativity of the marital union. Catholic home life is necessarily a sign of contradiction in today's society. We must inspire courage in Catholic couples to give the witness to the truth about marriage and family which our culture so sorely needs. We must help Christian homes to be the domestic church, according to the ancient description, the first place in which the Catholic faith is taught, celebrated, and lived. The whole church must help parents to live generously and faithfully their vocation to the married life. We must be especially attentive to families who are in trouble so that even in their suffering, they may enjoy the graces of the unity and peace of the Holy Family of Nazareth. In his post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, on the family, Pope John Paul II underlined the irreplaceable service of the family in a new evangelization. He declared, 
to the extent in which the Christian family accepts the gospel and matures in faith, it becomes an evangelizing community. Let us listen again to Paul VI. And then he quotes Pope Paul VI. The family, like the church, ought to be a place where the gospel is transmitted and from which the gospel radiates. In a family which is conscious of this mission, all the members evangelize and are evangelized. The parents not only communicate the gospel to their children, but from their children they can themselves receive the same gospel as deeply lived by them. And such a family becomes the evangelizer of many other families and of the neighborhood of which it forms part. It is clear that if a new evangelization is not taking place in marriages in the family, then it will not take place in the church or in society in general. At the same time, marriages transformed by the gospel are the first and most powerful agent of the transformation of society by the gospel. Here it is helpful to recall that marriage in accord with God's plan from the moment of creation is the participation in the divine love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the book of Genesis, our Lord reveals to us that he created man, male and female, to share in the mystery of his faithful and enduring love, which by its very nature gives and fosters new life. It is no surprise then that our Lord often refers to his covenant of love with us as spousal, like the love of a husband and wife for each other, and that the image of eternal life is the wedding feast of Christ, spouse of his mystical body, the Church. We read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Sacred Scripture begins with the creation of man and woman in the image and likeness of God and concludes with a vision of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Scripture speaks throughout of marriage and its mystery, its institution and the meaning God has given it, its origin and its end, its various realizations throughout the history of salvation. The difficulties arriving from sin, arising from sin, and its renewal in the Lord in the new covenant of Christ and the Church. When our Lord Jesus came in our human nature to save us from everlasting death and to give us a share in his divine life, he restored marriage to its original dignity, declaring God's plan for marriage from the beginning which is to be respected and honored by all at all times. Tomorrow we will be privileged in the gospel to hear this powerful teaching of our Lord. When considering the fundamental and irreplaceable good of marriage and the family for society, we must not fail to reflect upon the fact that our Lord chose to be born into the family of Joseph and Mary. And I want to make a point. Uh, uh, oftentimes it is said that Mary was the first uh, unwed mother. This is absolutely false. Mary and Joseph were espoused, but in those days espousal didn't mean engagement. They were fully married. And our, this is, God our Father wanted this. He would never want his son to be born into some kind of irregular situation. And so he wanted to provide, not only had he provided from all time, through her immaculate conception, our Blessed Mother to be the mother, but he also wanted our Lord to have a foster father, Saint Joseph. And so Mary and Joseph were truly married at, at the time of the Annunciation. And when our Blessed Mother and when the angel announces to her that she's to have a child, uh, she expresses wonderment. Uh, but she says, how can this be? Because I know not man. And by that she meant 
that she was a consecrated virgin and that she and St. Joseph had entered marriage understanding that they would both remain uh, in the virginal state. Uh, in some translations, uh, the response that she gives is, how can this be because I have no husband? It is simply a false translation. The, the Greek words are very clear, I know not man. In other words, she, as a virgin, she was not having uh, marital relations. Uh, and so she couldn't understand how uh, she would conceive uh, the divine child. But our Lord was obedient to his mother and foster father, growing up in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. He chose to manifest his glory for the first time in his public ministry at the wedding feast at Cana. And during his public ministry, he taught clearly and strongly the truth about marriage. And he liked to refer to himself as the bridegroom of his bride, the church. The witness of the family is therefore at the heart of a new evangelization. Commenting on the reality of the family as the domestic church or the little church, the Catechism of the Catholic Church declared, <coughs> In our time, in a world often alien and even hostile to faith, believing families are of primary importance as centers of living, radiant faith. For this reason, the Second Vatican Council, using an ancient expression, calls the family the Ecclesia Domestica. It is in the bosom of the family that parents are by word and example first heralds of the faith with regard to their children. They should encourage their children in the vocation which is, pro is proper to each child, fostering with special care and a religious vocation. We see in fact in an unmistakable way the evangelizing power of marriage and the family in the primary duty of parents to help their children to know their vocation in life and to embrace it with an undivided heart. At the heart of marriage and of family life is divine worship and prayer which give form to every other aspect of life. Sacred worship, the highest and most perfect expression of our life in Christ, is at the heart of family life. In the worship of God, in prayer, and in devotion, the family receives the power to evangelize and at the same time evangelizes the world most powerfully. The Catechism of the Catholic Church declares, it is here that the father of the family, the mother, children, and all members of the family exercise the priesthood of the baptized in a privileged way by the reception of the sacraments, prayer and thanksgiving, the witness of a holy life, and self-denial and active charity. Thus the home is the first school of Christian life and a school for human enrichment. Here one learns endurance and the joy of work, fraternal love, generous, even repeated forgiveness, and above all, divine worship in prayer and the offering of one's life. The family experiences its deepest being when it is at prayer especially at divine worship. From prayer and divine worship, every aspect of the personal life of each member of the family and of the family itself flows. The family at prayer and at worship manifests Christ alive in the church most powerfully and therefore attracts many other families to Christ in his holy church. It is my hope that my reflection on my own experience in the family and on some key texts regarding the family and a new evangelization will be an encouragement to all of you in your families and in your work to care for families. I see this so evidently in all of you. I've been privileged to visit with many of you, but I can 
uh, know by your presence here at this gathering and uh, simply by observing you that there is in the heart of each and every one of you uh, a very strong sense of the presence of Christ first and foremost in the family and from the family to the neighborhood and far beyond. May the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph bless all of our families. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before, thank you. Since I'm here, I think it would be a good time to offer a prayer of thanksgiving for this wonderful evening which we've had together, the wonderful food that was prepared, and we thank all of those who uh, prepared uh, uh, the meal. One thing that I've learned in New Zealand is that you will not go hungry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you're, the wonderful hospitality of you, of you of your your nation is shown particularly in a great abundance of, of food. Uh, as you can see, I I have not been going hungry, and so. But we will say the prayer of thanksgiving. And then also, it's an opportunity for us to to uh, be thankful for this weekend. I'm sure all of you are deeply conscious of all the work that it takes to to provide for such an evening together and for for these days together I should say not only this evening and we're deeply grateful to uh, Family Life International New Zealand strongly supported <coughs> by Human Life International uh, for for these uh, privileged hours together we have yet tomorrow and we'll have the, the beautiful closing mass we're all right here uh, in this very place. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we give thee thanks, almighty God, for these and all thy benefits, who livest and drainest forever and ever. May the divine assistance remain always with us, and may the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good and restful evening. Thank you.